Indianapolis. Is that right? Yep. The richest part of Florida. <laughs> And the man in Naples. <laughs> Naples, Florida. <laughs> the, the money man himself. <laughs> Eric Horvey, what's the name of that golf course you're at there? I'm in Newport Beach, California right now. Where? where I live. Newport Beach. The second richest part of the world right there. The home, <laughs> of, the home of the whole class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, went there, we went there with Betty and Rita one time. Cost us 500 a night for a little lousy hotel. Couldn't even sleep, get my feet at yeah. the edge of the bed. And and everybody was driving those things called M- M- McLarens or something like that. Oh, they're all over the place. We went to a McLaren dealership and they, I knocked on the window and the guy looked at me and said, get the hell down the road. Our betters is down yeah. the road. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then we got Richard Hughes from the UK and the Midlands. All right, guys, we're on. We are going to start in one minute. <clears throat> That actually was a good intro, don't you think? That was excellent. Yeah, all right. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, there's uh, enough people here. Everybody, hello, wherever you may be. And thank you for joining our show uh, today. And um, in order of present, well, before I do that, uh, I'm going to show you what we're going to do with this old script that we had, because there were so many questions. Like, they're gone, gone, gone out the door. And I've got my tech support fellow, my friend Rob Lance, my business partner from Swing Balance. He's going to help me out in case I screw up doing anything, which is probably likely. Um, today, we've got a really international group. And if you've signed up for this, it's because of all these great people we have. So we're going to be brief on introductions because we're going to get right to the heart of the matter, which is really nine guys talking about golf. Richard Hughes from the UK, the Midlands. How you doing? Eric Horvey from California. What's the name of that golf course again? To Harris Creek Golf Club. And Newport Beach, Newport California, Beach. one of the wealthiest oh, yeah. guys golf pros in the world. Dudley Hart, PGA Tour champion out there from Naples, Florida. Dudley, how are you? I'm good. How are you all? Great. We got Ryan Groves. And if it wasn't for Ryan, I wouldn't be back in golf. Ryan had taken over golf after John Thorpe left, asked me to come help him. Now he's doing everything. The hardest working guy in body track system. Mr. Dr. Rock Wu from Tai Pai. How's it going? Nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you for joining us so late at night in Tai Pai. And we've got the infamous Jake Thurm today. Jake, show us the new hairdo. Nothing going on? Uh, a little chopped. All uh, right. Still black. Yeah. Anyways, that's pretty good. Yeah. When I knew Jake, I had the same color of his hair as Jake. This is what he did to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Mr. Clint Rice from Australia. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. Good Good morning at 4 a.m. Yes, 4 a.m. And thank you for joining <laughs> us <laughs> at this godforsaken. But I get up at 4.30. I don't really feel all that sorry for you, except that I know how hard it is. It's crazy. Thanks for joining us. Owen Gibbons from Ireland, my friend. Thank you for joining us, sir. Awesome, Terry. Uh, glad to be on. Okay, so this is a really good opportunity uh, for all of us to talk about pressure mapping and anything that you all want to talk to from the audience. We're going to spend for those that pay attention to these types of things the first one third of our, our our discussion is based on the questions that have been sent in to me from last night to this morning and the next middle is going to be some panel questions and the last third we're going to uh, open it up to questions so guess what we've oversubscribed it's kind of like being on the golf course 220 to a tuck pin and i'm just going to go for it right from the get-go okay guys open panel and let's have some discussion on this. What's the best trace for an iron? Come on, let's go. Richard, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first. I've got, I've got two that I prefer. Okay. Um, my first one is heel toe, because that's what I see the most. I, I prefer that the, the trace will follow the pivot. So heel toe, is that, there you go. There's your heel toe pattern. So if, if the right hip's gonna pivot behind us, I think the trace should follow into that counterbalance into the trail heel. Um, I like it to work into that lead toe um, to create that angular velocity in the lead hip. And that's what I like to see. As long as we don't get stuck out on that lead toe in a, in a heel toe trace, I think we're doing okay. Um, the next thing, I mean, the, the next one, the two that I coach the most and that I look for the most is the heel toe and the linear trace, of course. Linear so, is going to give us both balance and power. So Ryan's actually trying to demonstrate that when we speak here. So oh, I don't see Ryan. Ryan's in the middle there, but the uh, Richard, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so fairly 
um, fairly lateral or, fa- or fairly linear. Um, and I completely agree with what Eric said there. Something a little bit out towards the, the heel, arcing a little bit toward the toe and then back in again is, uh, is ideal. Yeah. Now, Dudley, you've got a you've got this trace right here, right? Yeah, yeah. I, well, and and I didn't know crap about this stuff till I met you and Jake about five years ago, and and I still don't know much. So I'm the <laughs> dumbest guy on the panel by a long shot. But I I can tell you what I like to look for for me, and as as linear as I can get it. And I, as you and Jake know, um, I tend to fight a little getting on my toes, both directions really, and I get stuck on my toe, my lead toe on the way down sometimes it just I attribute it to the way I learned um a little bit you know my old man was a club pro and and taught taught a lot of hip slide back in the day and I think uh that's just kind of what I trained into my body for so long and relying on hands to square things up but uh I learned a lot from you guys uh about getting into my especially into my lead heel on the way down not only creating more speed but more stability with the face uh, well, Dudley your father was the uh, head pro at Lagorce yes yeah in Miami Beach and so he was taught by Jack Grout, correct? Uh, he no, he came in after Jack Grout. He came in after Jack Grout. Yeah, came right. in after Jack Grout. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, Ryan, what are you seeing out there that you like on the uh, for an iron trace? You know, the closer we can get to linear, the better off we're going to be. I think when we see most of our our amateur golfers, first of all, just standing here in balance, let that somewhere close to 50-50 is really, really hard. I mean, most of us are at a keyboard all day. We're in a car all day. We see a lot of amateurs that set up closer to this, where they're you know way out on their toes or they've got some sort of odd imbalance. So just the plain fact of starting somewhere close to 50-50, and I'll let you go over that, and then trying to get this thing to move as, as laterally, you know, as linearly as possible, because if you're already starting, let's say you start off and you look like this, you know, this is a club path that's, that's hard to manage, you know, just off the imbalances of the normal person, not, you know, the, the average player. I appreciate that. So Dr. Rock Wu in, in, in Asia, uh, is, is it the same as it is in North America and the UK? What's going on there for an iron trace in your opinion? Well, from an Asian perspective, uh, Asians are normally smaller. So we have a tendency to more to the right heel, to the left toe, more inside out swing. That's the tendency that we do prefer a more linear swing for most players because the COP trace. Also, we have to look at the different faces versus the distribution of the weight. Uh, when they start loading to the right versus the face of the swing. But I do like, I prefer the linear because most players have issues with hitting the ball, direction versus power, but it's really up to the coach uh, to find the first trace. Uh, we do see a little bit difference in the Japanese uh, customers that when we do TPI and the Koreans and the Chinese. But uh, like I said, I think linear is probably the best way to start. Um, the more to the center of the, uh, the arch is the more consistent way of playing the shot. That's very cool. Jake, what do you got? How about you, Jake? What are you saying? Oh, Jake uh, kicked out there. Uh, oh, he... Let's see. We'll go to Clint while you're figuring that out. Clint, what do you see in Australia? Hey, yeah, I'm probably going to repeat what um, has been said, but probably one thing we do see in Australia is um, probably that COP or the center of pressure getting into the lead side maybe a little bit early with the irons due to our often windy conditions. Right. Um, especially here in Melbourne and, and playing you know, around the sand belt with um, very tight, tight lies that we're probably seeing and maybe encouraging a little bit into that, that lead side a bit sooner to, to get that um, center point um, a little bit ahead of the ball. So. Pretty early out there in Australia, huh? It is, yeah. yeah. The brain's... <laughs> <laughs> That's a Dudley Hart comment. He texted me to say that. Owen, what do you, <laughs> what do you got? What, what do you see in Ireland, mate? Um, mixture between linear and lateral, uh, a bit of heel to toe. Um, it all kind of, from my experience, has always got through with release batteries. Yeah. Uh, so, what the face is like, age is another part of it. Um, so yeah, mostly 
what we will see is definitely leading heel to, to toe direction. Leading heel? Or he, no, sorry, trail heel to, to, to lead heel. Or to trail, lead, sorry. trail heel to lead heel. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Jake, what are you seeing in, in, in what are you seeing out there on tour and all around? Well, I, I agree with everything that I've heard so far. And while you were saying that, just to add something a little bit different, it reminded me of a drill that I got uh, from Hall of Fame teacher Chuck Cook, who used to take beginning level golfers, take their highest level uh, lofted club, and then he'd hang like a, a laundry uh, clothesline, basically 10 feet in front of them and about 10 feet high. And all he told these people, they didn't even know what end of the club to hold, to be honest, right? All he told them is, hey, all I want you to do is make sure the ball goes under it. And then secretly, he didn't care if it went under it, right? So it kind of subtracts that uh, natural uh, inclination by a beginning level player to want to stay back and work under, right? It's it, like scoop under. So um, I would say that if I'm starting off a brand new golfer, to quote Bob Toski, you go from the green back. So, uh, the, it, yes, linear, but how about the abbreviated trace? Because yeah. if the world, specifically amateur golfers, struggle getting into the lead side soon enough, then probably they shouldn't have any uh, too much of a center of mass shift to the trail side uh, just for uh, purposes of ball contact uh, uh, then turf, you know. So I would look there and I would look high lofted clubs and, and uh, shorter shots just like Toski advocated. And I love that drill by Chuck Cook. And when you do that drill on a body track, put the, the laundry line across, you're going to see that there's a lot less shifting to the trail side. So, okay. So the reason I wanted to start off with the, uh, this question is because I'm assuming everybody that's on this uh, seminar, this webinar, you know, we've all got practical experiences using pressure mapping. If you, if you are not my next webinar, I will just deal with, you know, what the traces look like, but, but for those that don't know, uh, a linear trace is basically what Dudley Hart represents, which is line back, line through. Now, Dudley, I've, I've got a question for you. Are you a field player or are you a technical player? Uh, very much a field player. So how Ideally. do you know? So when you get in the technical, I don't play as well. So. So, so it's just the way you feel. So when you were working, I saw you work a lot with Jake when we were at Calusa Pines and and I know that you work a lot in your game very, very hard. If there's one thing that's impressed me more than even your personality and great wisdom, just a nice guy. It's how hard you work in the golf game. I mean, you, you really work on your game, like, I mean, just all the time. You're, by the uh, way, your divots. Only... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it's the only way I've learned how to improve. And I think looking back on it, um, when I was younger, part of, part of me now um, feels like, I mean, I used to be a, a crazy practicer and, and uh, I think it was out of necessity because of the way, you know, I wouldn't say I ever had a technically beautiful swing. And I would, like I said earlier, I was, I was probably on my lead toe too much. Most of my career, I was an inside out timing the face. And I remember not liking taking time off because when I, when I came back, I mean, when I say time off, even three, four days, and maybe it was in my head, but I, I didn't, I, my timing was off and I hit the ball kind of poor. So I, I, uh, I didn't ever take a whole lot. I didn't play every tournament, but when I was home, I would go out and at least hit balls for an hour or so and then chip and putt and do stuff. That would be like an off day for me. So uh, um, I feel like now I have more knowledge about how my swing needs to move to be more repetitive without being able to hit a million balls because I can't physically do it at 52 and too many surgeries already. So uh, you've had brain um, surgery? You know, it, it, <laughs> No, I don't. Did you see that? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I told, Jake, I told Jake yesterday, take it easy on the, the big words because I got to try to follow this conversation. I, 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 I was, I was going to say, Dud, I, I gave you a little uh, technical yesterday, if you recall. All right. So oh, for, yeah. those that, for those that don't know it, this is a. Uh, that, a, a that move will a, help you. I, this is a heel to toe trace. I have a question to the panel. Uh, out of eight. Everybody said linear, and only two said, but everybody agreed. One person said lateral would be their second choice. And then, and everybody also kind of indicated that this trace was pretty good, this heel to toe trace. I have a question for Eric since you brought this up, Eric. If a golfer uh, has a heel to toe trace, um, 
and they hit the ball straight, all the pressures on their lead toe at impact, what do they do with their hands at impact? They're probably, they're probably getting pretty passive with their hands. Passive? Um, the, the, well, I mean, it could, I mean, if you're, if they're hitting it pretty straight, I mean, a lot of things can happen. It depends if they're timing it well and hitting it straight, I might leave it alone. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I true. Normally, what I normally see, and it sounds like what Dudley may be dealt with is what I normally see in a heel toe trace when I identify the trace and maybe not coaching the heel toe trace, I see a two way miss is what I see. And that's what I saw with one of my tour players before he made the champions tour. I saw a two way miss and we worked really hard to get that, get that, that heel toe to move back into that, that lead heel. And that started to control the face more. So if I've got a player that's heel toe, but hitting it pretty straight, I may leave that. I may leave that alone. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to try to get him linear if he's controlling. It's when I see the two way miss, when I know we've maybe got a we got a breaking issue and we're not accelerating into the into the lead. So a question: the, the case. We might not get off of this trace thing. So when we see a if you take that heel toe guy and you make him linear, let's say that he asked you or she asked you to change him and you made them linear, what's the first thing they're going to do with that ball, in your opinion, for our audience to be aware of? Oh, God. I mean, I can, you can see pretty much anything. I mean, on the first swing? Well, no, just I mean? in general. I'm not trying to um, trick, trick you here, but what I've seen is that the guys pull it the first few times. Usually, well, they'll, guys, yeah, they'll probably tend to pull the ball. Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll usually pull it. And uh, it was cool that Dudley said he got into his. Uh, and they're getting a little bit more mid foot earlier in the, in the game, so. Yeah. So now I and I promise you I'll get off of this iron trace, but this is really important because I've always found it difficult to have a to do a linear trace. I like everybody's opinion, and Doctor Rockwu, I want to ask you first because you're you've been up. It's very late for you, and I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time here. And Clint, I'm going to get back to you because it's really early. How do you get the guy, what do you do, Dr. Rockwood, to get somebody from, um, let's say, a scattered or a, a lateral trace to linear? What's your, what's your number one way of getting them there? I'd like everybody's opinion on this, actually. I'm not an expert in coaching, but uh, normally I'll look at also the body, maybe the pelvis. You know, that might be helpful. Uh, are they, do they have uh, the pelvis mobility? You know, things like this might help to identify how they um, – how they, what the trace is like that. Okay, Clint, what do you got there in Australia? What do you see? How do you make yeah. them linear? I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of kicking the shoes off, getting them in bare feet and um, being able to feel the ground a little bit better through the, through the feet. And uh, I think then matching it up with some biofeedback, having that in front of them and being able to work through the ground without the shoes, seeing the, the, uh, the pressure trace on the screen in front goes a long way. Tell you, when you're in trouble and not playing well, uh, somebody mentioned here, I think it was Jake that mentioned the uh, abbreviated trace, uh, the knockdown shot. I I've heard many players and, and say that, you know, when my game goes to hell in a handbasket and I'm on the middle of a golf course, I'm just going to hit knockdowns. What's your thoughts there? 100%. <clears throat> Probably the most valuable thing my father taught me as a young junior player was uh, how, what are you going to do when your golf swing doesn't feel great and you're playing? You can't just mail it in for the day and potentially <laughs> shoot yourself out of a tournament. You got to find your way, figure out a way to get the ball around and chip and putt your rear end off and, and get, try to get through the round. So my, what he suggested to me and what I agreed with and what I do is I hit, I hit little low. I don't, I don't overswing at anything when I don't feel quite right. And I hit low little, little peelers little fades and I, you know, it's a shot. I don't want to play for the rest of my life, but I, I've, I almost won the Buick open one year, finished third, literally sleeping three hours a night. Cause I didn't know where the ball was going. And I just woke <laughs> up and said, I'm hitting a neck cut, neck cut, neck cut. And if I had anything more than a six iron, I didn't even think about looking at the pin. I was just, let's make a par. And I was putting and chipping extremely well that week. So that gave me the, you know, the opportunity to be in that position. But my old man called me Saturday night and said, hey, go win this thing. I said, dad, I haven't slept two hours a night. I said, I don't want to stress up the Jesus and I, I don't know where it's going. And and uh, I managed to play okay, but uh, didn't really feel like I had much of a chance to win. But I had a good week just managing managing what I could do that particular week. I, I, I That's such a great story. And thank you for sharing. I always thought that the greatest difference between a professional and amateur is that the pros got to be ready for anything. It's when you score when you're not in a while that really counts, in my opinion. 
Terry, just to go back to that drill you were talking about there to, to try and get a little bit more linear, I use the kind of like the tennis ball where you cut it in half. Yeah. And you put it under their mid rift or their foot or, and just getting to use that on body track because not everyone has body track to rent out, which is something that we're obviously trying to, to, to get going into. Right. Uh, or, or to purchase it. So if we can give them a drill that they can use on the mat that they can bring home with them, everyone can buy a tennis ball for, you know, a euro or a dollar, whatever it may be, cut it and be able to change their trace using the tennis balls on either foot, which to me, I think works really well because they can see it on the, the biofeedback on the, on the app. And then they understand, okay, if I do this, I know I'm going to be getting that trace. So I think that's a real easy way to do it. And it's um, efficient. I like that a lot. Uh, Jake, what, what's your thoughts here on that? By the way, Owen, you, you must have read my mind because I was going to you next. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to improve that trace, like to show them that it can be done, I mean, the simplest way to do that on the next swing is to have them lift their toes. And then when they inside their shoe, their spikes don't have to come out of the ground, but they're, they're, they can lift their toes. And if you think that that's um, too simplistic, then I would challenge you with the fact that Nick Faldo told us he did that for six years and never told anyone because he thought it was weird and played the best golf of his life. So yeah, the very next swing, you could lift it up just to give yourself the feel of that. I promise you it will go less outward. And then um, with, and when you get really good, and this goes with the tennis ball too, but when you get really good, uh, you can have them down and then lift them in your downswing, like yeah. when you get coordinated enough. So that, that would start the process of that. Um, and then I, yeah, I have to agree with Doc Wu. I'm going to look at how the, the depth of the pelvis and, and you know, wh where that is moving and when uh, to cause that. And, and, it, and here's the thing about any trace, because I'm always asked like, well, when do you fix it? Like, you know, or... You have to fix it. I, the first thing I do is I try, I, I, I don't really, I don't really see it as a problem. I see it as their current solution. So I actually try to figure out why the player is moving that way uh, because obviously they're trying to achieve desirable results. So I first figure out why they have to do it that way to achieve results. And then that starts me down the process there. It's funny when you mentioned Sir Nick Faldo because I was just pulling out the square shoes when we met with Nick, I said, this will probably be the last time we ever see you. And sure enough, we're working together now on the square shoes product. But I mean, that's the cool thing about the, the shoes is it kind of loosens up the toe area, curls them up a little bit. Uh, 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 Ryan, I'm going to give you the hammer on this. But um, uh, Richard, in the, the one thing that we noticed at the key position at address for touring pros like Dudley Hart, they set up 5560. But we've got an international panel here today. And the one thing that I really noticed is that when we set up, when we were in Europe with uh, you and Jake, uh, we yeah. see that the European players set up much more stronger on the lead side. Uh, is, and I'm sure it's the same in Ireland and Australia. It, it's probably pretty windy out there. I don't know. Australia is a big island, but uh, I, I'm not being sarcastic. Like it's really windy where I live. We see more people sitting up strong on the lead side. Is that a fair assessment out there in the UK, Richard? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so because of the environment that we that we play in. So maybe a different environment to uh, to the states, and and maybe the task is different in the you know in the UK and in Europe uh, with the ball flight constraints or, or the as you said the the wind. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say that's fair. How about in Australia, Clint? What's the deal there? Um, sorry, what was that, Terry? Well, we see in North, North, in North America that what we're seeing with pro champions like Dudley Hart is that they set up 55 60 on the lead side in and around. Is that fairly consistent in Australia as well, or is that not the case? A yeah. little bit, depending on if, you, if you're more coastal. So, if you're one of the eastern um, uh, states that gets a lot of wind, definitely the lead side is more favorable uh, with a lot of people just, you know, playing in the wind quite often and quite quite tight lies so uh people are definitely sort of trying to definitely set up in that lead side a little bit more with the islands jake you uh, ryan you do a, a lot of teaching as well uh, you work with a lot of great uh, tour coaches what are you what are you seeing the guys doing to uh, help the golfers become more linear and i find that when no one's mentioned dynamic stability i found that uh, in our research that we found that uh, when golfers uh, approach the ball in a more linear fashion they're almost more like just vertical standing vertical uh, in a more normal lining up the joints on the lead side at impact 
uh, the, their body seems to be more in alignment when they're in a linear trace, uh, reducing injuries or the potential for reduction of injuries. What do you see, Ryan, out there for the linear trace? You know, and, and I, I got this drill from, uh, or this process from Mike Malaska when I was spending some time with him, um, you know, even before he had body track, I mean, he's got some, some pretty good ideas uh, about the way, and usually those, those golfers that are, that are especially way out on the toes, you, they're using the front side of their body a lot, uh, often too much. And so, um, you know, actually, it's not very COVID friendly now. Uh, cause you gotta be careful, but you know, getting down on your knees in front of somebody and kind of crossing your hands and having them join hands with you and work it like a cable cross where they have to pull that trail side away, uh, using that, that, that glute. I mean, you've got, you've got three different ways you can push your feet, right? You can push it like a gas pedal. You can push from the knee or, or you can push from the hip like you're really trying to stomp down. So if you can get them to feel where they're going to push that, that trail hip away with their, with, with their glute, with their hip and push down and then push the lead hip away that same way while you're holding, giving them some resistance, um, I find that straightens out the trace a lot. Nigel Randall mentioned in regards to what uh, I think Owen was talking, door wedges work. And uh, as well, and, and that's great, Ryan. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, 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 somebody asked about Emiliano Grillo, and uh, no one has seen it. You were the first guy to see it, Jake, on tour. So he has a, a kind of a toe heel go trace that nobody mentioned that trace, but that flow of energy is clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise where you go through the toes. What's your thoughts on that one, uh, Jake? Because Emiliano, have you, have you played golf with Emiliano Dudley? I haven't, no. He's a little short shit, shorter than you, and he hits the ball a ton. I mean, just around your height, I mean. I mean, no. You... <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure I outweigh him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, I'm sorry about that. But, but Jake, what's your thoughts on the toe heel goal trace? Uh, in regards to Emiliano, I wish he didn't change it. That'd be the first thought. And then the second thing was somebody that has a – uh, clockwise pressure load of the trail side, uh, trail foot in the backswing, um, and then goes from that trail heel to the uh, uh, to the lead heel is never gonna is never gonna struggle with the ability to maintain dynamic posture. So even if you're uh, putting the line on the line, but you have a counterclockwise pressure load on the trail foot in your backswing, when you get off or tired or whatever other excuse people come up with, they will struggle losing the depth of their pelvis during the downswing, which will move that towards the ball and they'll extend their spine away. And then obviously there's a loss of, uh, you know, club path control, low point um, and face control. So um, to me, and you asked about Emiliano, to me, I wish he never would have changed it because uh, I think it's pretty easy tour when you have a trace like that. Um, you know, for those who are asking in the audience, uh, I hope we're not boring you too much on the uh, on this linear trace. I decided to start with uh, what I feel is the optimal uh, solution for the irons. Now, Dudley, a question to you as a touring professional. Um, do you think it's the same string for a driver as it is the iron? Uh, not exactly. I don't, I mean, because the ball, the ball's off a tee. I do see a little bit of backup with my driver. Um, um, I don't, I still don't like the trace moving too much to the toe because I start, I don't really have a two way miss, but to me, I read the trace almost like a line in my golf swing to simplify it. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Just and if I'm running out to the, to the toe on the way down and, and my trace is kicking up there, then my club is swinging that way. And then what do I have to do to get the ball to go to where I want to? I have to flip it. Now, yeah. I don't miss it both ways very often because I've trained myself not to flip hook it. But my miss that drives me up a wall is, is a push push fade. And it's <laughs> a weak push fade, and I hate it. <laughs> and that's, to me, I've learned that as soon as I hit that, I know why I did it. I, I, have a, I mean, I know the face is an issue, but the, I feel like the face with me and most good players, I would guess, these guys here know a lot more than I do about that. But uh, I feel like the, for good players, your face is going to react to how your body or your path or your trace is moving. And you're going to react to give yourself a chance 
they had to succeed on that particular shot. So I've always, I've always said that the toes are the brakes, the heels are the accelerators, the ankles are the shock absorbers and the propulsion system. I'd like to do a panel poll here, um, starting with you, Rich. Uh, driver trace the same as an iron trace, typically for a good player. No. Eric? No, not, not typically. Yeah, go ahead, Eric, yourself. Uh, go ahead, Rich, you can elaborate. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like, I don't it be the I, I like what, what Dudley was just saying there. Obviously, the task is, is completely different when the ball is, is teared up to when it's on the floor. Uh, so good players are, are probably going to be orientating their angle of attack differently and, and for that you're going to see a different reaction on the on the ground. Clint, you were a very good player uh, before you started. And by the way, Clint, I never said this to you, but, you know, I think you were one of the first persons to ever reach out to me about distributing body track. Um, mm. Even before you were working with Rock, we were talking. Um, but you were a great player in your day. And not that you're past done or anything like that, past your due date. But uh, what do you see with the driver trace? Is it the same as an iron trace for good players out there? No, not typically, and, and and similar to what Richard was saying, just with obviously the ball being on the deck compared to being on the tee. And um, I think early days when I was before I moved back to Australia, doing a lot of work with Scott Hamilton. Um, Scotty, yeah, back in the early days, he he sort of exposed me to that when I was still playing. When he was um, doing some work with me and, and being able to understand, okay, yeah, hitting it off off the ground, compressing the ball, and uh, hitting down on it with an eye compared to trying to launch it. And, um, and, and it was quite interesting at the time. I was probably using myself a, a very straight face driver and um, not quite enough uh, launch. So I was actually probably backing up and trying to launch it excessively with a driver compared to my eyes. So you're backing up, trying to create dynamic loft? Yeah, my driver wasn't actually quite right for me at the time. Rock, uh, Dr. Rock mm. Wu in Asia, the, uh, I mean, like those guys are, they have a reputation for using extraordinarily long drivers considering their size. I'm not being rude to uh, my, uh, my name is Hashimoto, so, you know, this is self-inflicting wound here if I say anything negative against that. But, I mean, the Asians use multi, like crazy cool clubs, like some really massively long drivers. You're in the club manufacturing business as well. You've got a beautiful line of products. What, what, what are you seeing in the driver trace compared to the iron traces? Because I mean, they seem to be using drivers that like are three, four inches longer in some cases than normal. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know Richard and Clint also touched on that. I think for Asian, especially, we like the longer drivers. And normally, if you have a longer driver, you tend to have a little bit more side bend on the right side in order to uh, set it up um, to the bar. And and because we're shorter, and normally that the trace will be quite different between the two. But I would say from agent side, um, it's sometimes tough. I think uh, Jake was talking about changing a trace of a player. It's kind of tough to communicate with elite players when they have a dip, you know, longer than standard club. Um, so it's always good to find a coach to find the optimal setup for them and the trace uh, between uh, irons and drivers. We have a question from Neil Williams we're gonna address shortly. It's about uh, Kyle Berkshire's trace. And yes, we have seen that at length. Oh, and in, uh, in Ireland, there, do them boys swing the driver the same as they do the driver irons? Um, Terry, I, I, I presume it, what I've seen, it's a lot to do with shot shape, um, speed, age. Um, but I would say it differs. It definitely goes more to the, the heel to toe. Um, and the longer guy is kind of the, the Z dress um, backing up. Um, I, I would... Definitely say there's a difference because Ireland, um, weather conditions, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I would see uh, more with the draw type player um, would have a change in their trace. The fades would be more kind of matching is the way I could put it. All right, so Ryan and, 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 and Eric and Jake, I left you out of that driver thing, but I'm going to get right to you right now. So uh, we've, we've exhausted our conversation with regards to what's the best trace for an iron and, what the, and, and does the driver trace differ than that from the iron? And the unanimous decision is in most cases, yes. Was that a fair, are we good, are we good on that? Yeah. All right, so with that fall, so we're all of the same sort of voice here. And um, although Dudley, you know, you, you, you're looking at your driver trace, it's, it's, it's better. Th you always pick on yourself. I don't know why. I mean, your trace is, your iron trace is excellent. And your driver trace is really good in my opinion. It, it's yeah, from what I, I see. 
I just feel like sometimes I get stuck on my toe and that gets me in trouble. Like I don't get ultimately get cleared and get to my heel as quick as I want to that way that I just feel like I get a little stuck with that driver sometimes humping the goat kind of so to speak and <laughs> and uh um so that's something I look for because I feel like when you're trying to play golf and eliminate a miss and um you know el- eliminate one side of the golf course is a, for me a huge a huge thing especially with a driver and uh um, I feel like the more I get jammed on my toes, the more I bring in the possibility. Like I said, I don't really sweep hook it hardly ever, yeah. um, but it brings in the shot that, uh, sets that Irish blood of mine. <laughs> well, Owen should be able to address that. Okay. So over to, uh, uh, Eric, Ryan and uh, Jake here. So, and then this sets up the tone. Thank you for getting us through the driver and the iron trace. Uh, key points to take away, I, I'm, uh, and we've recorded this, is that basically everybody's the thinking that the linear trace lateral is not too bad, and we'll see a lot of heel to toe. I, from what I've seen, the heel to toe guys in an iron, they hit the ball pretty far. They're the long hitters and have a tendency to you flip their hands a little more at impact. Not that I have the final say on this. Okay, here's the question, and it's for everybody. And you know, we'll start with Eric, Ryan, and Jake on this, and you guys go at it. Golfer, this was sent to me, um, golfer has a Z trace in their driver and a lateral in their iron and is winning everything as a 14-year-old junior girl golfer. Everything. And I'm not going to name the junior golfer, but, but this girl has won everything across the United States and traveled all over. Are you going to change it? Keep in mind <laughs> what I, 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 I think I saw. I think I saw this trace or this swing, or you posted it somewhere. And and uh, gosh, I teach a lot of competitive junior golfers, and I, I don't know if I would change it. I wouldn't touch it. I might monitor it as as the uh, time goes on, and 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 look for things. I try to find what's good in the golf swing, um, the game, and and overanalyzing a trace. And uh, when things are going good, I might not. I might not do too much with it. So let me set the let, let me set this let me set the tone here and you know rock and everybody jump in on this after after Ryan and Jake have had a go at this please please because this is a legit question from her probably one of the I won't say the name but this girl's she's gonna be good and this is and by the way Dudley um, anecdotally congratulations on Ryan's success as a Gator oh, um, that's amazing. Uh, when Jake and I first started hanging around with Dudley many years ago, his son was an up and coming junior golfer. And I will never forget because I also have a son that's playing competitive sports. And I remember Dudley, you saying to it to me and, and Jake, Jake and I, I have no expectations. So you must have just have been in tears when he signed to your former alma mater um, as a Gator. Yeah, I was, ha- I was happy for him because he, once he got into golf, like his really his freshman year of high school, started playing competitive golf, you know, he, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I've been taking the football game since he was four or five years old. So he had no choice, but to be a Gator fan, he didn't have to go play golf at the university of Florida. And that he's, when he started playing competitive golf, he's like, that's where I want to go. And I'm thinking, dude, you're, I mean, just, I didn't think that was ever a possibility. And he worked his tail off and uh, to his credit, uh, he made it, he's got a long ways to go to, to, to help the team out, but he's there and he's uh, having a blast. Congratulations. Uh, Back, oh, and I mean that, I, I, anyways, you know how I feel about young men and ladies and sports. Okay, so, Eric, you're, and guys, after this, you're not going to change this junior golfer, but here's the, what I wanted to add. This junior golfer is five foot two, weighs less than 110 pounds, and jumps the living heck out of it at impact to get the Z traced. And she's not that strong physically, okay? And you're not going to, and you, and you said, you know, probably based on winning, you're not going to change anything. Jake, what do you think? Ryan, you two guys, what do you think? Do you think you're going to change anything? Going to mess with that, Jake? Uh, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had with Cameron McCormick at the Masters in 2017, where I um, he sat down and I go, you know what drives me crazy? And he goes, what's that? I go, how much credit you get for not changing Jordan Spieth? <laughs> because when because when he was two, 12 years old and meeting you for the first time, because because those that have seen Cameron, Cameron speak, he's a wonderful uh, public speaker. Uh, he always tells the story that the first time he met Jordan is when he was 12 years old. 
So he wanted to get, get to know him a little bit as they were looking for a coach. And um, basically he goes, okay, so you play in a lot of tournaments. Yes. Okay. Uh, when's the last time you played in a tournament? Okay. Last week. All right. What'd you shoot? He said 62. And he goes, what did the next guy shoot? And he goes, um, I think 77 or 76. So I, I always go to Cameron. I go, you get a lot of credit for not changing kind of Jordan's idiosyncrasy when you had a 12 year old that was shooting 62 and winning by 17. So um, yeah, I, the result, I mean, we're in the results business. The ultimately I don't care. We're not in the preference business, right? So if they're achieving results, I don't actually think um, that uh, Jordan's parents were looking for necessarily someone to change their son only to guide them. Right. So um, I actually think the real coaching that Cameron is doing is happening now in the traditional sense. But, um, you know, we say coach a lot, but maybe maybe we should say mentor, you know, we should talk about mentorship. So, no, if they're achieving results and they that at 12 years old, he's already playing better than I ever dreamed of. I'm, I'm inclined to just uh, ju- just to be there with them. So if the economy is good, don't don't make changes. And Terry, as soon as you take what's good out of that little girl's swing and go with the norm and go with what a co- and overcoach it, where you say, okay, you know what, we need you to be a little bit more, you know, connected to the ground. Um, we need your feet to be planted. You've just taken out what is good about her golf swing and what she's doing naturally to create the distance that she needs to compete. All right. Well, the only caveat it, it, I would put on that is is if you see something that may lead you to injury. Right. So I've got a girl that that's with us now who's who's a division one athlete, um, and played two years in a row at the at the women's Augusta National Amateur. And she does, she beats up on everybody and she just had her first knee surgery because nobody wants to change the fact that she does some really bad things with her tricks. And I think when you see something, it, it's always in it depends, right? If you see something that, that's, that's going to lead to injury, then, then yeah, probably will want to do some changes. But if, it's, if, if the joints line up and there's not damage to the body, then probably not. Eric, Clint, Rich, what do you guys have to say about this? Dudley, I'm curious what, I mean, you have your own son. You, you've watched your, I, I mean, we can make fun of this, but I know, I, I know you're a very serious guy. You, you, you've looked at your son's trace and, and, and we've discussed it sometimes and you shared it. But, I mean, would you make a change? You know, obviously I'm not a teacher um, and I have done a lot of work with my son, but he's also worked with some people a lot smarter than me, which isn't necessarily saying much, but I, <laughs> he was a little guy for a long, you know, he's still, my son, Ryan's five, seven, maybe just hit 140 and he swings it up to 118 uh, when he really rips at it. So he's created a lot of speed from a little, but he does things and has done things for a long time in his swing. Now he's training a lot of that out of it. But when he was younger, uh, he was a jumper. He was a flipper, but he was a hundred, you know, 90 pounds, a hundred pounds trying to create speed and me being a parent and just going, you know, he's having fun with it. He's getting better at some point when he gets bigger and stronger. Um, we'll maybe look at this stuff and that's, you know, that's why I've kind of stepped back a little bit from coaching him just because I don't do it every day. And, and when is the right time to change this, this, and this, and, and I don't want to screw him up obviously, but he, uh, there were a lot of things in his swing uh, that I didn't like, but I didn't think it was the right time to change it. Owen, Clint, Richard, you guys teach a lot of young, great golfers. I'm curious because this is a legitimate question. <laughs> like this, this girl's going to be like, she's going to make a lot of money, but uh, well, if she continues, who knows most think she could quit. But uh, uh, what do you guys think? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that, Terry. Um, so I think Eric and Jake were absolutely spot on. Um, I work with a lot of competitive youngsters as well, and I'm certainly not in the business of coaching traces. Um, I'm just trying to help people to to to, to play better golf. So um, she's clearly doing some really good stuff. Um, but then also uh, the the injury the injury thing it interests me. Um, so as coaches, how do we decide? whether somebody is going to get injured or not. How do we, how do we know that they're going to swing it a certain way and that's going to cause an injury? Uh, or 
do people just get injured anyway? How do how do we decide what kind of trace or movement is going to cause an injury? Well, if you don't line the joints up properly, for Christ's sake, you're going to get hurt. If you with those types of high velocity swings, I mean, wouldn't it make sense? I'm just taking a guess at it, but uh, based on experience, I mean, Dr. Rock Wu, you know, Clint, uh, you, you guys have got a lot of experience, and Dr. Rock Wu, you're. you're, you're I'm assuming that you've got a tremendous amount of knowledge in biomechanics. If those joints aren't lined up properly at impact, don't you stand a higher chance of uh, injuring yourself? Yes, if you look, you probably, I'll, I'll give, share a story with CT Pan, who plays on a PGA tour right now. Uh, I helped him when he was in NCAA and he had issue because he's not very tall. So we, what we did was before we changed, you know, help him with the swing, we put him on full Vicon, uh, Kistler force plates, uh, EMG. Uh, club sensors and launch monitors. So um, we didn't even, so the first thing is establish a baseline, what he has been doing for the past, you know, since he was playing and then try to find where he's been miss missing rather than go straight to the trace and say, this is good or bad. I think that's sometimes quite dangerous. Of course, we, we have to look at injury, you know, would this, uh, does he have a trace that will cause injury? It's, I think, but it's tough to find that because you need also the body segment data to verify does this cause injury, also the muscle data for EMG. So I would say if this girl is playing well, just like CD when he was winning on the NCAA, we, we have to be very careful because we're talking about uh, his future on the tour, you know? So that's my take on cool. and helping a player. Clint, Owen? I, yeah, I, I, I think, um, so yeah, Ryan and, and Rock and, everyone sort of mentioned it is is ultimately if it, yeah, it'll be injury so you know being able to have a, an efficient screen in place to um make sure the physical limitations aren't going to in um and have an effect on on a future but yeah mate i guess that's the only thing like winning's winning like you know, that's the that's the result is just effectively after so if the why you go and go and change the trace if the results are there but yeah this if there's a if there's any sign of injury or anything like that, well, that's obviously a sign that we need to look at making a change. Okay. Owen, well, what you got to add to that? Um, if they're winning, which is the, the number one priority and uh, the ball fight is predictable, uh, what I like to do is kind of do it like a blueprint where I, I'll put the, the player on body track, track man, and hack motion. <clears throat> where everything is linked together. Because some people's flaws can be other people's uh, positives. So someone might look at a certain trace and say, that's a problem, we have to change it. But that trace might cause a problem for another player. For example, that young girl is winning. So if she's winning, I wouldn't change it. But I, I definitely uh, take all the data to have a blueprint. And as she gets older, every year, adjust the situation and... and, and it, she's young, so you have to let her develop and see how she changes as well. She, her trace could change over the next three or four years. Well, we definitely have seen that uh, golfers with Z traces are not that big in stature normally. They're usually smaller people. Would that be a fair assessment to everybody? Yep. Yeah. So we're yep. seeing um, – yeah, Troy Mullins is in the perfect example of a young lady who's very strong, and she's – her, her lead side, her, her, her leg is very thick. She can really smoke it. She can hit a 360. And then Lisa Longball, I'm talking just women here now, she's kind of diminutive and small. And she gets up into the toes very early, and she has a Z-trace. They both hit a 360, but they both hit it differently. Troy Mullins is strong on the lead side. She's basically got a lateral trace, uh, trace and Lisa Longball has got a Z-trace. But they both hit a 360. The two different body statures. One is totally asymmetrical. Uh, which is Troy, she's strong on her lead side, and and um, and Lisa would be more, more of a symmetrical person and needs to be able to uh, vertically jump to launch it. I got a question for uh, Dudley. Uh, Dudley, uh, on the tour, okay, so just to finish that off, so we all kind of agree that the iron trace is linear, lateral, and heel to toe. Those are the three common best ones. And we all kind of agree, I'm assuming here, that, uh, that the driver trace can be usually – a fish hook and or a Z trace, or it can be any combination, but it's typically different than a driver. Is that fair? 
We're all good. Yeah. You guys can shoot me. This is meant to be a. I want to say something to piss everybody off and get this going like on fire, but I'm a little scared to be too controversial because I definitely won't ever invite me down to Calusa Pines again. <laughs> Tell uh, I remember you telling me a story when you first bought your launch monitor, uh, your track man, that you had to hide it from your wife because uh, you, you were scared that she'd find out how much it cost. You, 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 is that, was that, am I lying here or is that a fairly true story? Yeah, I might not have been 100% truthful with her on the cost of that track man, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I have a pretty good argument when it can, if it can help me uh, make some more cash on the golf course, uh, then, uh, then she, she was all for it. I remember you telling uh, uh, Jake and I that you, did, you didn't show it to until you won a lot of money on the next tournament. And then you said, this is, this, this helped me play better. So it's good now. Then she liked it. Is that? <laughs> I don't know if she liked She didn't even know what the hell it was, but she just <laughs> took off the, the check bigger Monday morning. All's good. All right. So here's the question. Dudley on tour. Just give me a range. Out of 10 tour guys, how many of them would have uh, uh, their own launch monitor? Right now, yeah. Uh, on the regular tour, I would say it it should be ten. How and many not, of them? How many of them do you think would have a pressure uh, mat of some of any type? Doesn't have to be body track. Eh, no offense. No, not at all. Not probably not many. Ha I mean, I'm sure they have access to it. Yeah, but not many have their own. Well, I'm glad you said that because that's that's the point of this question. Launch monitor costs somewhere between, you know, for a good one between ten and thirty thousand uh, dollars. Every like now, I should bring up for our audience here that uh, Dr. Rock Wu and, and Clint Rice are, are distributors for Biotrack, in addition to being great golfers, bomb mechanics, and so forth. That's the depth and quality of our distributorship. They are great players, great doctors, uh, great bomb mechanics, I should say. And these guys are selling Biotrack. They also sell launch. Why do so many people use launch, pay for it, such big price, and only yet after 10 years of doing this, uh, pressure mapping is still relatively new? What, what's the deal here, guys? I mean, open forum. Jake, start away. What do you think? You're the first. Jake was the first guy to take buy track to a PGA Tour event, dump it in the sand trap at the uh, John Deere, and then okay. also took it to Augusta with um, who? Uh, Streelman and Han. Yeah, Streelman and Han, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I have this. I I have a I have a flight scope in X3, and um, and actually, I'm building something outside, which uh, will be similar to what Chris Como did, but uh, it's far more impressive that I'm doing it because I'm married. Okay, so we're gonna have something out there, and that'll probably be foresight. Uh, is is uh, what we're thinking. So. Um, so I, I deal in 3d launch every day and I've always subscribed to, if you don't affect the ball flight, you don't improve the player. So, but here's the thing. There's the one thing I'll always say about track man, flight scope, foresight. They're very good at what telling, at telling you what happened. They're not, not very good at telling you how you got there. Body track tells you how you got there. Right. Yeah. So, um, there, there's a little, they, they, they better players, somebody like a, a Dudley, he'd be the first one to tell you because him and I have had this conversation in the past. There's a there. There's ways to fudge the numbers, right? There's ways to shallow out your angle of attack that's not going to be beneficial to you on the golf course. So as everybody's trying to get shallow, um, because that's like the hashtag at the moment. Um, as everybody's trying to get shallow, there's a way to make those numbers look like you were. And to be honest, I'm not. You know, I don't want to tee off in five minutes. So there's a way to manipulate the numbers because for the numbers sake, because it's telling you what happened, it, it's giving you no information on how you got there. So I used to, I, I love to use 3D um, and if it's the suit or if it's the wrist angles and I love to use body track in terms of the, uh, this is how those numbers were achieved. So, What's the big deal here? Why why is the market so slow um, to buy their own uh, body track? It's because they can go see you in the UK, Richard, because they can go see you, Owen. They can go see Clint Rice. They can go see Eric Corvey. They can go see Jake Thurm. But the market's been reluctant to buy their own uh, uh, body track units or pressure mapping systems. Do you think we're at the point now after doing this for a decade where the consumers are going to start buying their own, uh, their own pressure mats and, and start using it? 
No answers. <clears throat> Ryan, what do you think? Maybe, maybe. Is that, you know, I, sorry, I had to switch mics because somebody said I was muffled. So I hope this is better. Um, it, the, the driving force for the launch monitors was the club companies. If they could stick a one, if you had your old club and they can put another one down in front of you and the launch conditions got better and it went further, you spent $500 on a new driver. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate the confirmation on that. So, so right now, if, if we're having you use doing now and just move your equipment you brought with you, your body and your clubs better, you didn't spend any extra money. So, you know, that's, that's the key. Now, launch monitor technology is getting better. It's getting cheaper. And a lot of these folks, whether it's Rapsodo, Ernest, I know Full Swing's got one that's coming out that's going to destroy the market. You know, that, that, that just keeps getting more accessible. For still less than the price of a lot of those, you can get a body track and take it with you everywhere. I think I, that's the key. You, you could tell me to, to uh, steepen up my plane or make it flatter. I wouldn't know how to frig to do it. I, I could care less. I play a little bit of golf. I wasn't a, uh, a slouch. But if you tell if you tell me how if you can show me how to find dynamic balance in my pressure mapping says better just follow the lines I can improve my game validated by launch almost immediately I, I not that I'm having any struggles here I'm just trying to figure out because you know uh, on tour these guys will spend thirty thousand dollars for a, a a track man and it's only in the last three or four years we really I don't think there's a guy on tour that hasn't seen their trace would you agree to that Dudley there shouldn't be um... Because from a player standpoint, not a teacher again, I get nervous talking to all these, all you guys, because I don't want to <laughs> pretend like I'm a teacher because I'm not. But uh, um, from a player standpoint, I, when, when I see my numbers, if I'm just hitting on my track, man, a normal little practice day, and I'm, I mostly use it for numbers, but I look at a couple numbers in specific as, as you know, and relies to my path. If I see a path number going off, I immediately think of my feet and yeah. my feet fix it. And that's for me. And I've thanks to you and Jake years ago and, and me having my own body track and practicing on it. Uh, you know, I don't use it every day. I'm not going to lie to you. But when I'm when I question something, I can go on this thing immediately and go, OK, I'm, I'm off or no, I'm OK. Let's go on to the next uh, the next problem and figure out if that's why I'm not hitting the hitting the ball the way I want to. So it's it's uh it validates. It's it's like any like most of the technology we have now, which is great. There's no reason to guess. Yeah. And for a couple grand, you can get this. Yeah, I think I don't know if people get uh, I don't know if people get intimidated by trying to use it. I know as I was a little intimidated when I bought the TrackMan because I like I said I was a field guy and I'm not crazy smart and I don't want to think about all these things when I'm trying to play golf. But the the TrackMan and the Body Track, they both have made me more of a field player than I was. Cause I just try to feel what's this change. You know, if I think of this, what's that make all the other stuff do, what's my trace go, what's my path do. And you don't waste a lot of time working on maybe the wrong thing. You yeah. Know? The, um, the, the thing about, uh, no, I appreciate that. Dudley. A question was asked when we are speaking about the best trace, do you mean for distance accuracy or combination of both? And I want to address this personally, because the one thing I've learned from um, uh, over the years is that when, <laughs> I, when I increase your, uh, with, with specific regards to pressure mapping, if I improve your, your dispersion, I'm also giving you more distance. In the old days, when you made a selection between, in steel between distance or accuracy, you'd take a stiffer shaft for accuracy, a more flexible shaft for, for distance. What I'm finding is that when I can clean up somebody's trace, make it more linear, I'm also giving them more distance in their eyes. You guys feel free to dispute it. I mean, this is just my own observation. What are you guys seeing? Are you guys seeing that to be true or not? Rock, Eric, anybody? What we're doing is improving someone's efficiency, right? Yeah. That's, that's what that linear trace is. We're, we're taking wasted <clears throat> movement out of their swing, which automatically, most of the time, will add miles per hour and it will stabilize the face i mean that's it, you're not choosing one or the other you're getting both so somebody asked can we uh, can we measure a lie angle with a body track probably that's I mean, it, yeah it, it, what do you think if a guy's got too much pressure in the toes is the uh, can can we what would you think on the lie angle on that jake 
probably too flat. It, yeah, I was going to say I, I, that it would probably be too flat. I was just thinking about why people aren't buying body tracks. No, they are buying it. I'm, I'm, but, you know, no, I, no I, I mean tour players. Why don't they have their own and everything? I would say it's a lack of understanding of the matchups. That's what I'd say because – because when you give when you give awareness to a, to a movement to a movement uh, to a movement pattern change, I um, and let's say that this is one that would improve a player over the long term. I guarantee when you have the initial awareness that the pattern changes immediately and the movement improves. The only problem with that is the performance may not if the matchup is not to their best release pattern. So I think the hesitation by tour players to not have body tracks in their arsenal is why they rely on their instructors to have these things is because they don't understand the matchups that go with these things. They can improve the movement. Yes, but they actually might worsen the performance if they don't understand that this pattern, uh, this release pattern matches up with this trace and vice versa. All right. So that's what I was thinking about. So I, I've taken us down a couple of different rabbit holes, see which one looks the best, and I don't like any of them so far. But let's talk about the key drip, the key pressure positions in golf, in body track, because there are some people here that came to learn that. Um, the the what's the key pressure position number one of the dress? And he just throw it out there, uh, Richard Hughes. What do you got? What's the number one pressure position of the dress? So I like to see more pressure to the to the lead side. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I see organically when when a, a good player when I when I work with a good player that's what they do uh, but I would see the the exact opposite with most amateur players um, they'll tend to sit a little bit more on the on the trail side but then I also like to see uh, a little bit more pressure move to the lead side before the club swings back that, that's so like, a, we're like talking. a little pressure press or um, you know like an initiation like a trigger um, so I, I don't like the swing to start balanced. I like it to be off balance and uh, start a little bit in the lead side and then more pressure move to the lead side before we see the club uh, actually swing. So, Rock, in a good player, when do you see the pressure moving forward to the lead side? In and around P3, P4, P2? In a good player, Rock, when you see – in a good player, Yeah. You're, you're muted, Rock. Okay. <laughs> well, normally, like, players, like, uh, I agree with Richard, um, but it's different. Uh, normally, in order for the COB to move to the right, you need to shift to the opposite side. So uh, some players does shift to the left to initiate that uh, takeaway. But let's but talk about the, I, I, but about the pressure. So you've, you, that's pressure position number one, which is more heavy on the lead side. Pressure position number two. When does the white dot move forward to the lead side? Yeah. At the top of the swing? Uh, normally, you mean on the downswing? You're talking about top of backswing, initiating the downswing, right? So the pressure tra the transition pressure. when the white dot goes forward for a good player, when does that occur uh, typically? Uh, on the downswing, sometimes um, I don't have the, the research data on that, but I would assume that's before top of backswing. All That's right, where so the lead side, the, the lower body is moving to the left side while the upper body or the hand is still moving on the back swing. What do you see in that, Clint, in Australia? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's quite interesting the amount of coaches that will send me um, body track data <laughs> of their students and say, hey, you know, my student has shifted so early into the trail side on the back swing and they're already starting to shift to the lead side. And I'm like, well, that's, that's actually good. And then and they're, they're following up with the fact that he's hitting it really good. Like he's a, he's a great ball striker. And he's shifting, obviously, into his trail side before his hips are even getting, his hands are getting hip height. And then that trace is already starting to work back to the lead side well before the, the top of the backswing. Eric, what you got? Well, I, in my experience with my players is my best ball strikers actually begin going lead side about P. My best ball striker is P2. Yeah. Um, around P3, I'm already starting to see 70%. Uh, into the lead side so um, and I'm not sure I think I've seen DJ's trace he might be he might be with irons heavy lead side at P2 yeah he um, is yeah, he is my best ball strikers tend to go real early. Jake oh, okay, yeah. Jake Ryan on what you got there for the lead side uh, pressure going to the lead side early and, yeah anywhere from two to three from the game's longest players that's that's where you'll see that little lateral move of the pelvis but uh, anywhere from an inch to two inches 
is from the address position to the takeaway. So um, typically you're gonna see the highest amount of vertical pressure on the trail side, anywhere from two to three. And then um, especially if they were quick uh, and heavy to the trail side, then they'll be really quick and heavy to the lead side from there. Uh, Owen, what are you seeing? So we all, so first key pr pressure position at address 55, 60 or more on the lead side. Uh, uh, Dudley, you do all that. At P2 and P3, we're seeing the pressure already moving forward for a good player. At that position, Owen Ryan, what about counterbalance? Do you see pressure more on the toe or the trail here for a good player at that at that position? For one of the guys that I teach shot course record in um, in European tour events, uh, minus ten, his problem he was actually getting too much pressure into his trail heel. Where with a poor player, we see it more into their toes. Um, the kind of when you're talking pitch wedge nine eight. You're, it's probably 50-50, maybe 55-45, um, favoring the heel. When it gets into the, the driver or the six iron up, maybe 70 max. But with the, with the really good, with the, we say good players, their tendency is to get too much pressure in. Into the trail heel. Into yeah. the trail heel, yeah. Yeah, that's, we experienced that, Ryan. You've seen that too, Ryan, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's a potential you can get too loaded. I mean, especially if somebody's, working really hard on weight shift and they, you know, they got that concept in their head, you know, really, you know, mid nineties golf digest kind of stuff. Um, that could be okay. bad, but yeah, I agree with what, with what, and, and uh, with what Jake said. And, and, you know, that's, that doesn't matter what company you're with. I mean, you could be Dr. Scott Lynn, you can be Sasha McKenzie. I mean, all those things um, are, are talking about the same thing. Dudley, question to you. Yeah. When's the max vertical pressure on the trail side? What? <laughs> I don't even look at those. I don't even know how to look at those charts. I'm not going to begin to lie through that. Listen, you know, what? I have to understand something. I'm trying to play golf. All right. I can't think of all that stuff. I'm not. And it, it, that scared the crap out of me. I felt like I was in algebra class again. And I just woke up. <laughs> so listen, so, so the key pressure position, there are some people here that want some information or came here and thank you all those that did. We got another 26 minutes. We can, we can quit early if you want. But the number one key pressure position of golf we found with using by track and address people set up more on the lead side, 55, 60, a little more in Europe, uh, Australia. I, we've seen some of the stuff that you've done there, Clint. It looks a little bit like they might even set up more. So I guess it depends really on the conditions, whether it's windy or not. Uh, the, the first at pressure transition, when that white dot goes forward, everybody here agrees P2, P3 at the latest for a good player. And at P2, P3, we see 55, 60 trail heel. And the and in pros, the problem is the pros get too deep into the trail heel. Jake, tell us a story of what you did with Gary Hallberg. Uh, and Gary Hallberg was a – you remember he got too deep in the trail heel? What you what you do for that guy? What did, I was going to yeah. call him something, but I almost got, forgot I'm on TV. Yeah, so uh, it, it was funny because uh, his son was also there, and they were showing the kind of the same pattern. So – uh, anyways, uh, just to, just to, again, give them a feeling. Um, so again, the tour player that gets too much in the trail heel too soon is rotating his lower body too much as opposed to loading first. So he doesn't have that little, what Jim McLean would call that micro move, that little bump. So, um, when he was, uh, when he was loading too much, we actually, uh, deprived him of his trail heel and we told him to pick up the trail heel. Yeah. Uh, his spikes out of the ground so you get a little bit more load the funniest thing is a guy as talented as Gary I think four-time All-American obviously a PGA Tour winner um, somebody as talented as Gary was pretty convinced his trail heel was up now I felt I felt very uh, in and yet he would lightly put it down because he was rotating in his backswing but he was convinced it was up and I felt okay about giving that to him because a, a player that I had worked with on his putting uh, was Bill Haas, and he did that all the time with his uh, ball striking. So his trail heel was uh, was up at uh, at address and as they moved the club away. So uh, that that kind of straightened him out right away. Doctor, uh, a guy named David Lee wrote a book called Gravity Golf. He's the guy, the first guy that really brought up the notion. He's from Arkansas. He's the first guy that really came up with the notion of counter fall. We call it counterbalance. Your arms have a mass about twelve percent of your body weight, and that. You only weigh a buck fifty, so it's not very heavy. But uh, for a fat guy like me, I weigh two forty on a good day. Uh, so if I got twelve percent of that, I got thirty pounds moving towards impact. If I have thirty pounds of weight moving towards impact, 
I better have more pressure in my trail heels to offset the forces moving towards impact. So key pressure number one, 5560, we all agree on that at address. When the white dot moves forward for a good player, P23, we have a unanimous decision here with the boards. So everybody's saying P2, P3. By the time they reach the top of the swing, that's not really a position anymore. I've seen lots of different guys look different at the top of the swing, and they all have the same pressure trace for a good player, which it could be linear. Now, they all we have all agreed that there's going to be 55, 60 in the trail heel for a good player. Now, that, that also happens. Now, I like your opinion, guys, here, but that happens to be DVS, dynamic vertical force, max pressure number one on the trail side. When the, uh, and Owen, I see you shaking your head up and down, so you might agree with that or maybe not. So when the lead arm is parallel to when the lead arm is parallel to the ground on the way back, that's max vertical force on the trail side. You know, people get these things confused. We've always measured pressure in X, Y, and Z, but the only two times you really press down hard on the ground is when the pressure moves in a different direction. So there's really three times that the pressure is kind of heavy. Uh, once when you move it from the left to the right, if you're a right-handed golfer. The next time when you break on the trail side to go forward. And finally, when you break just prior to impact. Would you all agree to that or am I just full of shit? Well, I'm full of yeah. shit, but would you agree with it anyways? I don't know if you can see it. I have it on the back of the screen there, Terry. Maybe you can see it. I do. That's that's two different questions, Terry. Yeah, I'm right. Well, go ahead, Owen. The pressure here, I have it in quite early in my swing. About P2. Then I kind of unweight and then I push again. Yeah, very well done. Yeah, but I, I, I probably have, I would say, I'm too lateral or horizontal. We've got, we're going to open up this panel to, uh, we've got 20 minutes left. I'm sorry I got a little bit carried away with the optimal traces, but we're not done the key positions yet. I do, I feel, I'll feel malpractice if I don't get done the key pressures, key pressure points. So number one, address heavy. Lead side 5560, COP moves forward, P2, P3. Counterbalance 5560 at, at, at pressure transition when the lead arm is parallel to the ground on the way back. That's also max vertical force on the trail side. And then when, when okay, Richard, Eric, when is the max vertical force on the lead side ideally uh, timed? P5? Late. Oh, sorry, yeah. Richard. Yeah, lead, lead, lead arm parallel to the floor, maybe just before. Really? That's exactly right. Eric, would you say the same? Yeah. Guys, are we in conjunction here, Clint? Clint? Yeah, Rock? Okay, Owen? Jake? Okay, Ryan? Good. So, guys, we talked earlier. I got stalled in the presentation. We lost two. Two came and back in. I'm paying attention. You know, it's important that we keep the energy high because that's what people want, and that's truly who I am anyways. But I wanted people to understand that there's a difference between the driver trace and the iron trace. We all agreed with that. I think that's a very fundamental, important thing. Me, now, me personally, just to be a pain in the ass, I would tell that young lady's parents that she's going to get hurt if she has a Z trace and she's not very big. But that's why I don't do what you do for a living. I just do what I do. Um, but I would want to know if uh, my daughter is potentially going to get hurt. I think I heard that from about all of you, too is that maybe you might want to just let them know that safety first. A lot of people would find that hard to believe about me, but I do have a kid, and when they train, we do incline training at, at very high speeds because it improves their gait. Because I don't want guys running, compensating. I don't want people out of balance with their, or, you know, Dr. Rock. If, if you're swinging and your, line, your joints aren't in line, probably you're going to get injured at some point in your life. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes. Especially running. Yeah, running. And, and, you know, really, you know, golfing is kind of running towards impact. So anyways, almost done with the key pressure points. One question asked, and I'm going to open this up to questions. I'm sorry I didn't respond to the chats. I'm, I'm only a single task. I'm kind of like Dudley. I can only think of one thing at a time. Just kidding, Dudley. Uh, <laughs> so how much pressure goes to the trail side? Let's start with a wedge. Eric and Richard, and then I want to ask Dudley and Owen for and Rock for there. So wedge, how much pressure to the trail side? Forget toe heel. How much in a normal wedge shot? How much pressure should you get to the I, trail I, side? In an, in, in an abbreviated trace, I'm coaching 65 to 70 percent lead side to start, and very very little movement, if any, 
um, to the right. Would you agree with that, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, dependent on how far you're hitting the wedge. Are you, are you talking? Is it a full wedge shot or an off? Full wedge shot. shot. All full shots for this full, conversation. Full, full shot. So yeah, um, yeah, somewhere in that region. I, I'd agree. I'd agree totally. How about an impact? What would you say? Lead side. 80, 85? Yeah. yeah but definitely. I mean, I, yeah, you have to. You're controlling dynamic loft, and that's what Jake touched on earlier. We I, mean, really, I mean, you're yep. all about controlling dynamic loft. And there's the, if the, more, the more a player, from a pressure standpoint, real quickly, from a pressure standpoint and injury standpoint, for me, day to day, anybody that's hanging back on their right foot has a potential for lumbar spine injuries. I mean, so if I can just keep people on their lead side – at the proper times, I think that's why it's important to teach pressure at certain times in the golf swing and where it should be, and, and you're going to reduce injury. Any hangback hooks, any hangback players, is, they're really, really, you know, looking at a lower back injury. Top three pressure flaws in golf, too much pressure on the toes during a golf or swing, backing up in an iron for a young kid and old guys like me, hanging back. Dudley, I saw you put your hand up there. Is that, is that an injury you're suffering from? Well, I mean, you know, only God knows the answer to this, but learn, I look back, I've had two spinal fusion surgeries on uh, same level, but I had one that didn't go right. So I had to redo it. But anyway, I look back and I think a lot of it had to do with the way, the way I learned how to swing a golf club and driving my hips. You know, my old man used to say, fire your hips to right field, fire your hips to right field. And I did it a gajillion times. And I feel like that was probably a contributing factor to why my, my back broke down on me. I, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know for sure, but it's sure, it's sure uh, looking back on it and knowing what I know now, um, it definitely put way more heat on my low back than, than I needed to do. I agree. So uh, we only got 15 minutes left and thanks. I want to open up the question. So uh, Dudley, Dr. Rock, Owen, Ryan, Jake, Clint, the longer, would you, is it safe to say the longer the club, the more pressure you get to the trail side? I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Drivers. Yeah. So how much pressure, you know, all three, all six of you guys, what would you recommend for a, a, a driver? How much pressure should they get to the trail side at pressure transition? 60, 70, 80, 90? What do you recommend? And does it vary? Normal driver shot. 80, 85 for me. I've seen up to 95, and to me, that's excessive, but it can work. All right. Um, I've got a couple of bonus questions uh, around in case there are no questions. I'd like to open it up to the, uh, to the group here, to the, uh, to, the, to the people that have joined us. Uh, questions and answers. Uh, has anybody seen Kyle Berkshire's trace, and how does it compare uh, BDEB with the driver? I don't know what that means, but um, we've seen Kyle Berkshire's trace. I think we've all seen it. <clears throat> it's a Z trace. Well, it's a it's a dynamic trace, right? I mean, I think that the important part is Kyle moves already to get himself started. And I think what Terry and I talked about was that he and Justin James are the guy that that have an extra break in the system, right? So he he moves it back and has a break there. So, you know, he's starting out dynamically, breaks on the lead side to push it back, breaks on the trail side to push it forward, breaks again. But when that foot rotates off and, you know, he's, he's you know, and that's a, that's a result. He's not trying, to, but that's a result. He's got that extra break. That, that trail foot is still pushing really hard to keep his center of mass moving toward the target uh, and create that dynamic loft position. So, he and Justin James are both swinging it over 150 miles an hour. I think that's where they're getting that, that extra oomph. Owen and Clint, what's the best trace for a driver if it's not – what is the best driver trace if not linear? KK Karan Kamar asked. For uh, distance, I would say it's said trace. Okay. <clears throat> Clint? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. And especially more so with um, the amount of um, coaches and players using like super speed and those types of products to get, you know, increase club head speed and maximize distance. Ken asked, uh, what's Matt Kuchar's iron and driver trace? Um, I'm going to throw this out to the group here. 
Uh, I've never been able to, except with one thing, be able to determine a golfer's trace without seeing it on a pressure mat. And when I see the trail heel down like Mo Norman used to do and or uh, you guys in the States called banking, my suggestion is to you that, that I, I, I bet pretty much all I got in my pocket, which is usually between five hundred and three thousand dollars and $3,000, that that's going to be a linear. <laughs> that's going to be a linear chase. Why are you laughing at me, Delhi? That's <laughs> your beauty. <laughs> So I, I bet that that's linear. That's the only time I could ever tell without looking at a pre, at, at, on, on a pressure mat. Is that fair assessment, guys? Yes, it is. Uh, I, I have some inside information because I was talking to Mike Adams right after he went with him, which is before he went twice again last year. I think it's a very linear trace. He just burned his rotation before he burned his lateral. So you got to go lateral rotation and then vertical. And he was throwing rotation, lateral, vertical. And when they fixed that, all of a sudden he won twice in a year when he hadn't won in like seven years, seven or 11 years. So it's a very linear trace. It's built on accuracy, not power, but he, he, he's a phenomenal set of hands. Adam Novak, good be of ours, says, what do you guys see when dealing with a student that has had lead side hip knee injury replacements? Well, I don't know. I usually see the guy can't, not strong enough to hold the pressure on lead side and got back up typically. What would you guys all say to that? Or, or doesn't even get to the lead side? Or does yeah, so, hanging back, right? So he's, he's just staying off, staying away from there completely. Yeah, he's staying away from that. And I don't know how the hell to get to the rest of these questions. Rob, do you know how to get to these? Uh, maybe that was it. That's all eight. Um, chats, okay. Uh, does anybody have an opinion on the relationship between the trace and face plane tilt. I'm assuming dynamic loft. I'd say the more pressure you get to the lead side, the less tilt you're going to have vertically. So you're going to, have the, you know, the face angle is going to be down if you can keep the pressure to the lead side. Wrong or right, guys? Yeah, if we're talking loft, I mean, yeah, you're, you're more lead side pressure. I mean, most of the time, your dynamic loft is going to be influenced in that way. I, I, um, I, we don't have a lot of time left and, and I, I want to forgive the audience if I lost a couple of people because we spent a lot of time on linear and driver trace, but I got to be very honest with everybody here today. Everybody asked me that bloody question and up until now, I've never asked it. So next time I'm not going to bring it up. So it might be a more little lively conversation, but we got rid of that crap. It's done for 2021. We all agree now what the best traces for the irons and woods are. Now, I, I have I have a question. for When, when I traveled, because I'm a fat old dude, and I'd always hang around with these trainers, and I'd always ask a trainer, look, just give me one exercise to do when I'm traveling, because I'm not going to go to the bloody gym and put I'll take 20 minutes to put on the shorts, and then I got to get sweaty and get a sweat, and then I got to go have a shower and all that shit. That's a waste of time when I could be eating chicken wings and going to having a beer. So why would I want to do that? So I try to make golf my exercise. And I always say to them, look, just give me one sample of uh, something to do. My buddy sitting beside me, Rob Lance, my partner in, in the swing balance, they all tell me squat. So now here's the deal. Because a squat's a great thing, right, Rob? That's a, that's a great thing to do. All right. So here's the question across the board. And then we're done. And I can't thank you guys enough for doing this. Rock, everybody, you know, Clint. But we're going to start with you, Richard Hughes. What's the one pressure mapping tip you're going to give somebody? The number one, you only got one thing to tell them. And if you don't say it right, you don't get through the pearly gates. What's the one pressure mapping trip you're going to give them? Step drills. What's that going to do for you, mate? Help you to get a nice trace. Help you to move your, move your, your pressure well. Your step drills. All right. That's pretty easy. Eric Horvé, what are you going to do? I'm going to have everybody get to their lead side as early as possible. Okay, so Andy Plummer, long story short, when Andy Plummer was an early adopter, I want to tell you guys a true Chris Como story, by the way. Can I do that? So Como doesn't have any cash, and he wants, to, and he's at Rice getting his master's, and he wants to borrow a computer so he can use a buy track. We sent him a buy track. We didn't send him a computer. We didn't have any money either. We said, go get one off of one of the guys. 
So you got one off the guys. You think Chris Coleman could lend me some money? Now, I think he's done pretty well learning all this stuff, don't you? Not a bad career. How do you get Tiger Woods after going from race universe? Anyways, it doesn't matter. But where I'm going with this is Andy Plummer, he would never send me the traces of his players. He's an early adopter, Andy Plummer, Chris Coleman. So Andy Plummer, after a while, we get to know him, and he sends us the traces. Well, sure enough, all his guys get pressured to the trail side, you know, significant pressure to the trail side, but they get pressure to the lead side around P2, which is what we found out to be an ideal thing. I think if he had body track uh, before he named his system stack and tilt, because he was right in what he's doing, but (laughs) I don't think, you know, he might not call it stack and tilt. He did just, because the pressure does go to the trail side. It just gets to the lead side so quick. So you say, how would you get them to do the pressure to the lead side quick, Eric? I love the step drill. I love the, I love the, to the right, to the left, your, you know, your, your golf dance is great. I'm Thank you. People to keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. Dudley Hart. You're going to get the last word today, by the way, Dudley. What would you do to, what would you do to, uh, you, 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 to a struggling golfer to get using body track? What would you get them to do? What's number one? The, the most beneficial thing that I learned from it. And I got, I'm going to steal this from you and Jake is toes up. Yeah, baby, toes up. Throw them toes up the to Sam Snead drill. Get the pressure from the medial, a transverse medial arch. Get it back into the midfoot. Keep it there. Dr. Yeah, Rob, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see many of my buddies uh, that get to their lead heel too soon. That over rotate, you know what I mean? They get yeah. that being much of an it. Now, I don't teach, but I don't see anybody that's going that way too quick. No, you know? I agree totally. And, uh, and it's a speed. Speed gainer for me. I mean, that drill and lift the heel and slam it down to get that feeling of weight in the heel. When I do either one of those drills, I swing it two to four miles an hour faster. So that, that tells you something right there. Dr. Rock Wu, what's your suggestion? I'd like to use body track to teach putting because I think this is a great tool to, um, to keep the lower body or the body more passive and letting that, you know, rock, the shoulders rock. I love that because, you know, it's funny. We don't talk enough about that. And that's sincerely do appreciate you bringing that up because a lot of my cousins, uh, you know, they, they move around a lot on their backswing, you know, short shots that, you know, like the, they, they just, they don't, they don't, it's hard to teach them not to move around too much. And so when they I get that wild feedback from the, the by track, they see it and they, they really, they get it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the short game, especially the chips, the chip, you know, chipping and putting very helpful. Owen, what do you see? What do you recommend to your? What's the one? Just one thing. You only got time for a minute and a half with these guys. What's the one thing you're gonna give them? Impact. Oh, love it. Impact. Get, How do you get, teach them impact? Um, obviously step drill a little bit. Uh, the right heel down drill. Yeah. Uh, um, drill with the uh, the golf club under their their trail foot. Uh, so that the golf club's behind them to to keep that there as they're increasing pressure in in transition very cool clint rice australia what do you do over there to get people down i'm thinking along the lines of a shifting board yeah shifting board left right left left hold right left can you explain that to us um if you're not familiar with the board plank with a, a ridge through the center so you can get the feel of the pressure going from uh trail to lead side so um, like Eric and, and Richard both mentioned, one of the main differences between a, an average ball striker to an elite ball striker is how early they get into the lead side. So being able to train them on the Shefty board, on and off the mat, being able to, uh, to measure the, the improvement through uh, keeping the feel of what the board's doing. Very cool. Very cool. Ryan Rules, you've been traveling, busting your hump for the past uh, two years on body track. What's the one thing you're telling everybody? Jake, I'm giving you the hammer. Let's uh, set up balls for them, and instead of them having walk forward, walk backward. So, what? so taking backward steps as you're going through the set, so it engages the the rear side more. That's pretty cool. What's that? What what's that hitting rock? What's hitting the rear end abductors? What's it going on there? What's what's the what's that what's that going to hit? That's okay. Jake, what do you got? Uh, the world struggles getting pressure in the lead side soon enough. Uh, all these fine coaches and doctors have already expressed that. So for the sake of being different, 
Um, the body track is portable, so they use environmental education. In other words, put it on a downslope and give them a high lofted club, and I promise you that they'll get that pressure in the lead side sooner, or otherwise they're going to hit the ball in the forehead. Uh, and, and, and if you don't have a downslope, then instead of getting them to swing the club, get them to throw the fucking thing. <laughs> Seriously, they'll get the pressure and lead side soon enough. And then they get to leave the lesson with you saying that they learned how to throw clubs, which yeah, every well, golfer really needs to know how to do anyways. Now that's something I can teach people. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, um, somebody asked us uh, about the uh, Boy Track app. It's a work in progress. It's free. Uh, we will have it uh, more synchronized shortly. There's a lot of integrated partners today, and, and, and two of our guests today – uh, Dr. Rock Wu and, and, and Mr. Clint Wright, uh, Asia and Australia, respectively. They, they, they not only represent body track, they represent other companies. We say thanks to our integrated partners. We have V1, who's been exceptional with us. They probably had no question about it, the best mobile application for the phone and the iPad in the world. We're very thankful to Steve Gould from GASP, who is one of our early adopters. He also is sells gas systems with AMTI force plates. We'll get into that another day. It's just a higher level of meaning and understanding. And God bless to uh, Steve for giving us an opportunity to work with him. We integrate with Swing Grill, which happens to be my favorite because I just like 3D and it's easy to use, but we're all different. We all have got different objectives. Uh, Clint, I believe you've also got other products that you've got, Rock. You've got heads, shafts. You have shafts too, Rock? Uh, no, I don't have shafts. Just hit Just you CNC, man. CNC mills heads. Very cool stuff. We also integrate with uh, Sam Putt. That's a fairly fresh thing that we're doing uh, as well. And we're also integrating with String Technologies, which is a flight scope integrated solution for PC Windows only. We also integrate with two more companies. Ernest Sports is going to integrate Bytrack with our new, with their new B1 down the line launch monitor for only $550 going all the way up to their ES20. And I'm pleased to announce we just got a call this morning confirming that FlightScope is going to finish off the integration to their, to their gear. So, guys, uh, I'm sorry I took you down the rabbit holes, for, but I just – and I really appreciate you taking the time because that's long and dry. This has been 90 minutes from around the world. Richard Hughes in the U.K., God bless you, man. Stay at a lot. I know it's a pain in the butt, this lockdown – Eric Harvey, I want to get. To, I don't have enough money to get to Newport Beach, but I want to ask my friend Dudley Hart to lend me some. And um, yeah, you know, Dudley, I can't wait to see you in Calusa Pine someday soon, man. Yeah. Rock, I want to get to Asia one day, and we want to get to a seminar. And we really appreciate your, appreciate your support over the years. Thank you for your business, uh, Owen Gibbons. Thank you so much, sir. Ireland, I, I swear to Jesus, I want to get down there and play some of them Irish golf courses and just get blind pissed drunk with you sometime soon. Uh, I'm not sitting here, you know, you know. And then when I'm when I'm in Ireland, I might as well go to Australia and take my son and just get more pissed blind drunk with you. There, Clint Rice, it's been an unbelievable good time. Ryan, you're coming with me, so just shut the hell up. And Jake, Thurm, you really love you. And um, thank you, guys. This has been crazy. Sorry for the long and dry. I'm going to invite you guys all back sometime on an individual basis, but I wanted a global perspective today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Over and out, guys. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. See you all.